Depending what metric you look up, supposedly companies are losing as much as 20%, if not more, due to bad data quality. Now, we all know that everyone loves to talk about how important data quality is, especially as we're heading into a world that seems to be gung-ho about AI. Yet, we have many examples, like the uh, Google Bard example, where they put out erroneous data and that impacted their stock price heavily. So, in this video, what I wanted to talk about were data quality and how we actually even implement data quality checks into systems. Like, we're actually going to talk about different types of data quality checks, how you create systems that check data quality. So we're actually going to talk about how you de design those systems and why you might use one over the other. So we're really going to be talking about exactly how you could even build some of your own systems. And again, the point here is that data quality, in my opinion, is very important, but we often rush past it because it's not as sexy as building a data pipeline. So let's talk about first how you can actually even check your data. Now, if you've been in the data world for a while, you may have seen some of these checks Maybe you haven't, but here are some of the key ones you'll generally see. First, let's talk about range checks, or at least that's what I call them, is data range checks. These are generally focused on numeric data sets, where you assume that there is a certain range those numbers should generally be. Now, when implemented, there's a few different ways you might put this check in. For example, you might use something where you have some model that detects if there's an anomaly. And so if you exceed or uh, go below a certain number that's typical, like let's say you're used to only seeing $1,000 transactions in your uh, system, you might see a million dollar transaction and be like, hey, we should probably check that out. In fact, this actually happened to me at one company where we suddenly started seeing these $200,000 transactions, which wasn't actually even bad data. In this case, it was something where the process was wrong and someone was being allowed to spend $200,000 where they shouldn't have. So it's not even that data quality checks always catch sometimes bad data, but just erroneous steps in the process that need to be checked. And so that's your essential range check, right? You should see it from X to X. You should see from X to Y, right? Like there's a certain range that you should expect numbers. And if they exceed those expectations, you should probably check that. Another common check that you will often see is what I call category checks. And when I say category, I mean, generally, there are entities or values that have something that either do with category, or maybe you're just expecting a certain set of values that never change. For example, I'll give you the clearest one I always think of, states or state abbreviations. Um, they're not necessarily categories, but they're some sort of limited set of values, and you shouldn't get anything other than those limited sets of values. I say that because as someone who has done a state abbreviation check, I've actually gotten states that were non-existent, right? I assumed that more than likely on the other side, the system did some sort of data quality check or had a drop down. So how could you possibly get anything that wasn't a state abbreviation? And yet we got at least a handful, I think it was like four or five uh, abbreviations that didn't exist. And they came into our system from the operational system. And so you often need to check for this. I, I call this category checks because sometimes uh, the way you might think about it is that maybe you have certain types of actions or events that can occur in your system and you only expect those events to occur. PTO is another example where we had like various types of PTO and every once in a while we would get a new type of PTO because the operational team wouldn't tell us that they created it no matter what we asked them to do. So we would just have to create a check that basically yelled at us whenever we saw something where there wasn't a check that matched or wasn't a category that matched what we were expecting. Quick pause, everyone. I just want to say thank you so much to our sponsor today, Dcube. Dcube is a platform that helps companies build trust and governance in their data and AI products. As we gear towards LLMs and AI products, high quality and trustworthy data are extremely critical to meet business goals and objectives. Don't solve the problem for silos, but review the overarching goals of how we as data teams can deliver trusted data access across the value chain. With Dcube's lineage and incident details, know where the incident took place and understand their impact on downstream assets. Dcube is not limited to databases or warehouses. In fact, Dcube observes the data pipeline, DBT jobs, Fivetran, Airflow to extract the job runs, lineage, incidents, along with logs. Dcube is a truly unified data platform which manages data observability, discovery, and governance all in one. Their tagline is Dcube, observe, discover, govern, start your journey towards trust and governance today. You can visit uh, dcube.io uh, to learn more. With that guys, again, thanks so much to our sponsor and let's get back to the actual content. Next, another very obvious type of check is the data type check. And this one's actually super important, especially in these systems where some people do not put 
uh, you know, that that should be a date field, that should be the integer field. It's really important that you check your data types because sometimes what happens, especially if you're loading data from files and headless files, so something that doesn't have a header, you might not have the right order come every time. I've had a company where I've worked with them heavily to set, send me a CSV the same way every time. And for six months, it might be fine where we get the same data every time in the same sets of rows and columns and everything's perfect. Great. Then for some reason, either someone quits or someone for some reason changes the automated script. And now suddenly you're getting a different uh, field where you expected a date. And so it's great to have a quick data type check to make sure, hey, are these dates or are these just the values that I'm expecting? Because again, sometimes people do ship these around and you do not want to figure that out after you've loaded the data into staging. So hopefully you can catch that at raw. Another common check is what is known as a freshness check. Now this is interesting. So if you bring up uh, this pill, like these pillars of data quality, one of the things that often is referenced is timeliness because data isn't just accurate in the sense of is the data right as of yesterday, if you're working in a lot of companies, they might know that certain data has occurred or certain transactions has occurred. And if your system isn't fresh or up to date to maybe what an executive expects, they're going to be a little frustrated when they look at a report and they see, hey, the, this number uh, hasn't been updated in two days or something. And they were expecting that. Or more likely, they don't even know that's what caused it. They just know they don't see a transaction that should be captured. And they're going to be like, hey, your system is not working correctly because it didn't capture this transaction that happened 30 seconds ago. And so this is often why there are data freshness checks to tell you how fresh the data is. Usually what you'll do is have some sort of warning that tells you if it goes beyond a certain level. Uh, and on the other side, on your dashboards, you should put a little thing that says updated as of a certain date. That way people kind of at least know what that data represents. Another very useful test that I've seen be useful multiple times is volume tests. So this essentially states that have a check where you're looking at how much data is actually being loaded. So this is just the counter rows that are being loaded per day. Because generally, if you're a company, you should see a similar amount of rows, except for generally on weekends, depending on what type of company you are, that occur on most days. And if you suddenly see three, four, five times that number, there's a problem somewhere. And I've very much seen that happen multiple times in multiple data sets where a system somewhere goes wrong right uh, generally this is an operational system where something changed and suddenly you're starting to see massive amounts more of data and that should set off alarm bells like why am i seeing more data than i saw yesterday is there something in an operational system and in fact we've seen this happen where a new feature was released and suddenly we're getting 10 times the amount of data that's coming in and we shouldn't be right we're now seeing 10 times the amount of transactions because something in the the operational system wasn't created correctly and is now firing off way too many requests that we're now tracking. And so this is a great check just for sanity. Like if you're seeing a crazy amount of rows or less rows, something is more than likely wrong. Now for now, I'm gonna go with one more test that you should definitely implement, which is the null test. Uh, this generally, the way you'll implement it is that either you're gonna set it to there can't be any nulls, which is one way to set it, or you'll set that there's a certain percentage of the fields that you allow to be null. And then maybe you put some sort of filler if you need to, depending on the field into that field when required because nulls act weird and you need to make sure you understand that. So null tests are also super valuable. Now that we've talked about some of the types of tests you might implement, let's talk about how you actually implement them. Like what is the system that you create that lets you know, hey, something's gone wrong. And the truth is that different companies need different levels of checks. Some companies that I've worked for are very okay with the very light checks that I'm going to discuss where it's gonna be like, these are very simple ways you can implement it. And others want to develop entire systems that are all around data quality, while still others look for out of the box solutions like our sponsor today uh, to cover a lot of that because they don't have an army of engineers to build these solutions. So let's talk about some of these options. Let's start with the easiest thing I think to implement, which is Slack messages. And I've had to do this for some of my clients where maybe they didn't want to have a complex system, but instead they knew that they had a very limited set of data sets. So instead of having to build a complex system that would cost them a lot of money, we create an automated uh, set of checks that would run at the end of all of their key jobs. And basically it would just run all of these checks. And if any of them failed, it would send a Slack message with a list of failures so that the data engineer uh, on call could see them. It's not super fancy. Honestly, it was just a bunch of unions for all of these checks. And it's also not very generalized, right? Like I had to write each one uh, individually. 
versus what we'll talk about more in the future where you create a generalized system. But if you only have 10 checks and that's all you're really running, you're not planning to add more, and it is supporting everything you need, that could be sufficient. I always think it's important to figure out, hey, there's costs and there's trade-offs and you need to figure out, and you need to find the system that works best for you based on what decisions are being made off that data and how much budget you're willing to implement. Another way that a lot of people implement data quality checks, and this one can be implemented along with the Slack messages, is a data quality dashboard. Now, in particular, I see this a lot with volume checks, uh, freshness checks, and things of that nature, where they're constantly trying to say, you know, maybe you've got some high-level metrics that say um, key tables and letting you know which key tables have been loaded and when, so you can kind of see some red flashing ones if it goes beyond, let's say, 24 hours, and volume checks where you like say, like, okay, how many rows are we getting for these key tables? Are we still seeing the number, the right number? Because this is one of those things where you might have the data updated, but maybe the data that's updated is only 10 rows and you're expecting 100,000, right? So you want to make sure you've got a few different ways you can see on this data quality dashboard what where something could have gone wrong. You might include some of the other checks we talked about before, like null checks, uh, just all on a dashboard. The problem is then you have to know where to look and you have to actually go through it all. So that's why it's kind of nice to combine it with the Slack checks. That way you kind of have one place that you can see some of the checks when they occur and maybe another place where if you need to go uh, see what's going on, you know, you can see more a live interface of it with the dashboard. So one's kind of automated and one's more of a live uh, approach that's running all the time. Now, taking a step further than that, like I said, you can develop these data quality systems. And earlier I referenced that they're very generalized. So in my experience, when I've built them, what you essentially end up doing is having some sort of either Python or some sort of script that you've built that abstracts the fact that you're checking something, right? So you can write a SQL function so you can write a SQL query that you can essentially pass in. So you can have a whole list of them. Often we would just have a whole list somewhere, either listed in a folder somewhere or maybe in your database. Uh, you'd have what type of check it was. You know, was it a range check, et cetera. Maybe you'd have how many failures you'd allow kind of in this in the columns of the rows of your system. That way, when this automated system ran, it would pick up these queries. And instead of having to create an individual one for each of these, you just already had abstracted these away. So every time you actually add in a new check, you're just having to add in the row into your table rather than the other option, which would be writing a new query and then having to you know change code. You're not having to change code in the system. You're just having to uh, interject it into a table somewhere. And so this is one way that I see a lot of people do it. Um, the other thing that they might do and may or may not do is then track the output. So that's the big thing that some of these systems that you have to pay for. That's the big thing that especially a lot of vendors do um, is they track the change over time. So how well is your data um, acting over time? So you'll see a lot of this in many systems where they actually track um, you know, how, how healthy a table is, how many failures do you often have on this, this uh, table, um, where you may or may not do that if you build your own system because it takes more time. But that's generally what it is. You've got the SQL-based system that has some sort of code-based wrapper. I said Python earlier, but it could be any code that you end up using. We were using PowerShell, honestly. And then that runs everything and loops through it all and then tracks it all and then generally saves it or outputs it somewhere that you can see it later. And that's more of the in-house developed system. Now, another way you can often run data quality checks, and this is how we did it at Facebook, um, you should have a bunch of DQ operators. And so DQ stands for data quality operators. Um, so if you've used Airflow, it, there's everything's referenced as uh, operators. Facebook uses something similar to Airflow, so everything's referenced as operators. Basically, data quality operators are pre-built, um, essentially, tasks that you can run and will automatically actually interject into the tracking system. So I referenced earlier, you'd have to build your own if you did it yourself. But we had, you know, abstracted it to a point where you could just reference this DQ operator and that would automatically feed into our whole data catalog. You could see the data quality checks, you could see the health, It'd all be there in one because it was super abstracted to the point where you just have to pretty much put the query there, set expectations, and it would run and tell you, and, and you just have to set like, should it fail or should it not succeed based on um, certain parameters. And so that's a great way, um, especially once you start getting far enough along and you have enough engineers to build your own system. And of course, there are solutions like dbt that come with dbt tests, and you can kind of check some of this out. Uh, even there, you like there's some basic ones that you can include. For example, they have tests such as unique, uh, not null, except the values, which kind of as they're saying, you know, the unique checks if it's a unique value, not null accepts, you know, checks on the not null factor that we talked about earlier, and so on. You can also create your own generic tests. So that way, as these tables are running, you run dbt tests as well if you're building these models in dbt. Again, that is limited to the fact you're using dbt, and that's the only place that's going to actually work. 
So as referenced before, data quality is becoming more and more important as we want to make these kind of crazy decisions and automated systems uh, in the future with all of this technology with AI, etc. It just pushes the need for higher data quality because we do not want, you know, things and bad things to happen because we're going to rely on these systems, I imagine, more and more in the real world and so that data needs to be of the highest quality meaning that like we discussed there's a ton of data quality checks you can run everything from uniqueness checks to data to range checks uh, to not null checks etc uh, and there's a lot of different ways you can actually implement those systems whether it's just a few slack messages that yell at you um, to let you know if something's gone wrong or if you've built an entire system or if you've looked to purchase one um, like our sponsor today, which again, thank you DEQ for sponsoring this video. And with that guys, I really hope you guys have learned how you can set up your own data quality systems. That way, if you're using something like SQL or Python, you can build out your own system quickly. Um, or if you need to find one that you can purchase, or if you just need to set up a few Slack uh, notifications, you can just do that. With it guys, I want to say thanks so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks all. Goodbye.